But Infinity Wars was by far, well, not by far. It was obviously better, but Endgame is the biggest movie of all time. Well, if I were young, I would watch the Avengers movies. That's good. You're young. Well, relatively speaking, my dad's 97. Yeah. So How come I'm, I've never met your dad? I'm young. My dad's around and still Where active. Is he? he even still drives. He's got his driver's license <laughs> renewed till he's 99. I don't know where that's is he. Good, he's in Orange County, in Central Orange County. Why have you never something. introduced me to him? Uh, I don't know, but I want to meet your. Does he look just like you? Uh, I, well, we can we can maybe show a picture of him. Yeah, he looks a little like Colonel Sanders now. He never we never oh. had grown a beard when he was. Uh, well, you don't look younger. like Colonel Sanders. No, not yet. Okay, maybe yeah. you just you have to put a little bit of weight on, right? Yeah. So does yeah. he is he no, like you? But my dad's skinny. He's a skinny. skinny so yeah. he, but he looks like Colonel Sanders. Skinny Colonel Sanders. Skinny Colonel Sanders. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We are now confident, and we come in with a power that is unforeseen previously. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Such don't you power. think? <laughs> yeah. Much wow. Yeah. Such power. Marshall, you are powerful. Thank you. You too. I wasn't fishing. <laughs> you said it as if I was fishing for a compliment. Yeah, I, I kind of thought wasn't. when there was an awkward pause, I figured he's fishing for a compliment. No. Give it to him. Thank you for the compliment. Oh, you're welcome. But it was obviously fake because you no, were just, wasn't you, it? you thought just I was fishing and you're just trying just to. I thought you were fishing for it doesn't mean it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> Roll the credits. The credits? Are we done? Yeah. What are we going to talk about today, Stan? Every time I think, like, maybe this intro won't be awkward. <laughs> I don't even It waste. ends up surprising even me. I don't waste my time <laughs> thinking that. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think today's episode is about creativity. Creativity is a big topic. Yes. So you want to limit it for us? Oh, yeah. Wait, my notes. I'm not organized in my thoughts, but I got a million of them, ah, so we'll crap. try to sort them as we go. I forgot oh, to write my notes that. down. <laughs> <laughs> it's a blank page that literally says creativity <laughs> at the top. You're creatively bankrupt. <laughs> Maybe that's a metaphor. The, the oh, blank snaps. page prompts you to write your own. I'm just kidding. I think story. I forgot to transfer it. Okay. I think it's in here. Hold on. Oh, I'm patient. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's just nice to be here at the Proco Studios. I'm ready. Okay. I think okay, we let's should go. start by defining creativity. It's the thing to start with. Yeah. What do we mean by creativity? Yeah. How do you define it? Okay. So. I think the definition of creativity is the ability to come up with original ideas, right? That sounds good to me. My idea of it is a little bit more than that. Explain. Because I think that coming up with an original idea is actually incredibly easy. Okay. So anyone can be super creative. You want me to yeah, yeah, You yeah, want yeah, me to give you an example? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically being creative or coming up with new ideas is about uh, connecting things together, C connecting two things or multiple things together that haven't been combined before, right? I believe kind that. Of. So uh, one way of just thinking of a random thing is to start broad and slowly narrow it, it, narrow it down. Th this helps me. So like if I just ask you to come up with a random thing, your mind is just going to be like uh, sky, car, cup computer like it's very things that are obvious right but then you're not going to think of anything really that interesting until you go deeper into it for example pick a category like uh bugs mm -hmm. and then you think okay now think of a bug and now you can think of a much more random thing mm -hmm. than just a bug like a spider you can think like, well what's a unique type of bug a bed bug okay most people wouldn't think of a bed bug when you just ask them to think of something random. Okay. Okay. So now we got one really unique thing. Uh, another th another category: sports. Mm -hmm. Think of a unique sport. Okay. Uh, boxing. Boxing. Mm, that that's not that unique. That, that's okay. that's well, one yeah, thing that yeah, people yeah, would I'm, actually. I'm How about like scuba diving? Is that a sport? Uh, it's kind of weird. Yeah, Whatever. I like it. Okay. <laughs> 
scuba diving. All right. So then you try to combine those two really random things that have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. Um, I, I for one combine? would love to watch a show about scuba diving bed bugs. Scuba diving bed bugs. <laughs> the bed is a water bed. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> brilliant. That's brilliant. The bed is a water bed, and bed bugs are scuba diving. Yeah, I just came up with a unique idea, but who cares right. that the idea exists? That doesn't mean I'm creative just because I came up with this idea. You're going through the motions of creativity, but it yeah. was not to solve a problem. Exactly. The true creativity comes in making that idea work. Yes. Now, it's, it's like, now make it something. And that, because true creativity is actually problem solving in ways that matter, I think. It's innovation. It's taking a, a creative idea and bringing it to fruition. Like if you're making a movie about bed bugs that scuba dive, uh -huh. the, the true creativity comes in writing that story in a way that is fun to watch because mm -hmm. you could really mess that up. And then mm -hmm. is it really a good idea if you mess it up? It could well, still be a, idea, a good idea, but no, it will be perceived as a bad idea. <laughs> well, we're starting out in harmony with each other. I agree that the first thing, well, in defining creativity, uh, it is to solve problems. It's to work something out where you don't have a manual that tells you to do it. There's no formula that's already devised for this. So you've got to come up with a new formula to solve a problem. And the most common dynamic of that is to make connections that nobody ever made before. Those are, those are big abstract definitions, but I think yeah. that it, with, with that as an umbrella where we're starting. Yeah, uh, but you don't always have to make connections that have never been made before. I think uh, right, you can right. they, they solve a problem to. in a way that has been solved before and you, you're still being creative. Mm -hmm. Do you want to uh, give examples of that? or in, in the bigger sense, like you can bring an idea to reality with a series of many different problems you're solving. Some of those problems you're solving in ways that have been solved before, but because you you know that they've been solved like that, you're being you're being creative by creating something. Mm -hmm. You're coming up with new ideas, really. Even if they aren't new to the world, they're new to you. Yeah, I guess. If you so. were to reinvent the wheel because you knew nothing about the wheel, it would still be creative to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Uh, at least in your in your process, even if it's not going to make any difference in the world outside. Yeah. So I think we're we're starting to separate the process of creativity and the purpose of it. Right. I guess maybe my, I'm trying to come up with the definition of a creative person versus what does the word creativity mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, creativity might just be connecting different things and coming up with the new ideas, but a creative person doesn't just do that. They also make it work. Mm-hmm. They do it with a purpose. Okay. But the root word of creativity is to create, to right. make something. Yeah. Whether it's something that never existed before or whether it's a combination of things. Figure every invention that we've got is a combination of things that existed before. Your smartphone is made out of sand and it's got electricity oh, really? in it, which is fire. Wait, what part of it is sand? The glass. The gl oh, okay. I mean, you know, the, you know all, every, everything that, was, that goes into these inventions came out of the earth. It already existed. It's just somebody got ways, complex ways, of putting them, putting them together that nobody had ever done before. Huh. As elaborate as the process is, it all boils down to stuff that's already in existence. Yeah, that's the whole thing about platforms. You start with a platform to innovate. Right, like I don't, I don't, I don't know that. I, don't, um, I forgot where I, I heard about this, but like you can create things or innovate off of someone else's innovation. Mm -hmm. Like, let me see. Let's say Apple couldn't exist before the internet. Mm -hmm. Then Angry Birds couldn't exist before Apple. Yeah, and then maybe something else was built on top of Angry Birds. We're know, all building on previous. Company. Previous huh. creativity. That just kind of reminded me. Angry of that. Birds, the movie, wouldn't exist without Angry Birds. Exactly. There yeah. you go. And then think how much happier some people would be. <laughs> okay, so we've defined creativity as problem solving. Mm -hmm. There's a process to it. You, you, it's, uh, the connections thing was an interesting thing. You, you were the technique that you were referring to about putting two things together that were different. One creativity technique in attempting to teach creativity is called forced juxtaposition, 
where you take things that have nothing to do with each other. Advertisers do this. They take two things that have nothing to do with each other and put them together and brainstorm ways they could relate. And since they are the, the least likely combinations you would make, you are forced to find connections that can be really creative. Nobody else would be looking in that way. So you're yeah. choosing specifically well, to find diving bed bugs. Yeah, yeah. And then you can come up with more ideas than just a water bed. You, mm-hmm. you can take those two ideas and come up with 10 other ways you can combine those 10 ideas, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. But we're being abstract still. Yeah. Okay. We're, where, we're, where are you we're, trying to bring this? Yeah. Uh, the, the water bed and the bed bug and the scuba diving is concrete. Uh, where are we going with this, though? What is the thing that we are trying to do in defining creativity and that it solves oh, problems? Oh, well, we're, I guess we're trying to, in this episode, answer the question of how can you become more creative? Okay. So, I guess one way is to do this exercise of combining new things in new ways. Just make a list every once in a while. Yeah. Just a random thing. It's just a, an exercise for your brain. Like you're on the toilet, you got nothing to do, mm-hmm. spend five minutes coming up with random things and thinking of ways that you, you can combine them. You're just, ex- you're expanding that type of thinking in, of, of your brain. Do you know Sterling Hundley, Sterling Clinton Hundley's no. illustrations or teaching? No. He's been an award-winning illustrator for many, many years and he uh, teaches a class in ideation And he has one of the best methods that I know of for coming up with ideas, say for magazine covers or illustrations. And it has to do with making columns of words and also little symbols, the the simplest cartoon image that you can make to represent a word. And then crossing these columns over to find connections that you would never have done if you hadn't gone through the work of putting it out in front of you. Yeah. And he, he teaches it really well and he's trained some people who've done great work too, but it's one of the most effective uh, modern uh, practical courses and Sterling, Sterling has, has lived it out as well as explained it really well to students. But it's, yeah. that's not really forced juxtaposition so much as it is making columns of opportunities for juxtapositions and connections. Okay. Before we move on, this awkward silence, since it will be cut, can I read a few of my notes just to myself? Sure. Thank you. I didn't think of it as an awkward silence. I was seeing it as an opportunity for (laughs) reflection. (laughs) Okay, thanks, Marshall. And insight, maybe a revelation. Great, Marshall. Now we can't cut the awkward silence. No, you got to leave it in there. <laughs> nah. That was my strategy. Boy, I'm really thinking, of, I feel like I'm on a creative roll right now. I had originally thought that the question that somebody wrote was, can you learn creativity? Uh-huh. Or can you, how do you teach creativity? But it might have been, can you learn creativity? I think you can get better at being creative. Yeah. Yeah learning creativity sounds weird to me what is it because it's like there's an end to it like i've learned creativity but there isn't it's just it's a skill that can you can be you can level up as you practice yeah you can just get better and better at it i don't know it's not a subject like learning algebra Mm -hmm. it's a skill i don't know it sounds weird it's yeah it's a skill (laughs) Maybe I should just assert my opinion, but you, you've got uh, you've got notes. Do I don't you have wanna... too many. The only one that we kind of crossed on, or we already kind of talked about it, though, and I wanted to mention is cross training, okay. which is directly tied to what we've already said. The multidisciplines the thing that we talked about. Yes, um, and it's pretty obvious how that connects to what we were just talking about. Because mm-hmm. if you can learn more things about many different things, you have more dots to connect. Mm-hmm. You have more to go to to grab onto random ideas and you also have more knowledge about how to properly connect random things Mm -hmm. because you're just more knowledgeable in in all these different mediums and so you can bring a solution from one medium to another medium. Um, So that's how cross training can help. Here's one of my favorite examples of that. Stephen Sondheim in his two book, two volume books about songwriting mentions at the beginning of it all that he 
reads cooking manuals, recipes, things that cooks care about, and uh-huh. he is not a cook. So why would he do this? Because he sees that the care that cooks give to their ingredients and their putting together of them is relatable to the process of writing a song. So he's looking at songwriting metaphorically as preparing a dish, all of this preliminary work to get the finished thing. I think that's, that's to me, one of the three fundamental principles of creativity is mm-hmm. the seeking connections, make, uh, metaphors. Yeah. Metaphoric thinking is just at the, at the base of it. Or he's just hungry. Or, yeah, that's right. You get two things taken <laughs> like, care of at once. Why do you yeah. watch food shows, right? It just gets <laughs> me in the mood. it looks delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I don't cook, but I like watching other people cook. Yeah. Instagram okay. <laughs> is for art and food pictures. I actually don't have any food pictures in my Instagram feed. Hmm. Well, I don't follow people that post food pictures, and if they did, I'd unfollow them. <laughs> and yet you seem to have this strange curiosity with my diet. I don't get this. Because I feel like you have a secret that you're not sharing with oh, me. Oh, no, no. I'm serious. Okay, I feel yeah, like I, there's I, something I, in your diet that probably helps you be really uh, productive and have mental clarity, huh. and you, you, you seem very deliberate with the way you eat. Yeah. And so I'm just, I'm just curious about how you approach it, because okay. I could probably learn from it. Well, now that's I'm ta- why I ask. Now I'm taking it as a compliment. Okay, I see it a is a compliment. But it's bringing us back to last episode. Yeah, uh, I think I already answered it. You're not going to talk about it. Well, I just I, I <laughs> you brought I, it up. I, I bring my own food with me. That's the whole thing. Oh. I just yeah, I feed myself. Yeah. Okay. So now let's go back to yeah, the yeah, topic yeah. of creativity. Gee, thanks though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we were talking about multidisciplines across. Uh, Training, Dis- cost, cross, cross training, put, putting together multiple things. Sondheim seeing songwriting as... Well, you, you wanted to talk about teaching creativity. I want to talk about teaching creativity. Let me hear what you have to say. In 2005, I was teaching at a university where I had had a semester or two or three of students who I was so exasperated with because they had no interest in learning the craft for the most part. They had good students in there, but I was so exasperated that I wrote a note to myself that I reread before this that said, you can't teach creativity. You cannot make other people competent because I was pouring this energy into trying to teach students who would not, uh, there's just no, it could not be taught. But I wrote, you can help those who are inclined toward it, who want it, to master it uh, more quickly and better. So you can guide them. You can guide. You. I don't believe you can teach creativity, now, but I why? believe you can learn it. I and, think in understanding why you can't teach it might help learn it. You can't teach it because it must come from the person who is going to be creative, to truly want to be creative, not to have a badge that says I'm creative, but to be involved in the process of mm. solving problems and the love of doing that is the first requirement. You cannot teach a person. And how do you know who, who that person is? Here is the way a photographer uh, dealt with who came to speak to my students. He said, here's, here's this kind of test for students, is that he had all these big black bags of photography equipment and he's going to unload them on these students and say, figure out what these things do. Figure <laughs> out what, which one of these pieces of equipment connects to the others. You can figure that out by looking at the connections and seeing which ones they fit and then why you would need it. And he said that in watching students do that, he can tell which ones are going to be photographers. He can tell which ones are going to be creative is because you give them enough to solve a problem, and then when they come to you with a question of, this part I can't figure out, they at least were working on it. But if all they want is a manual for how does it all fit together, that means they they don't have the creative bug. Mm -hmm. They just as soon follow directions as try to figure out how something works and figure out a new solution to something that I'm trying to do, which to me is a hallmark of a person who's going to be creative. So here's the way I'd sum it up. You don't need to to teach creativity because there are some people who are wound up to where with no teacher, they will find a way to be creative. And those are the ones who are most likely to really want someone to simplify the struggle 
toward creative solutions for them. And then there are definitely some things that can be taught. Perfect. So let's say you have this group of students mm -hmm. that are naturally problem solvers and they want to create something new. Curious, interested, yes. enthusiastic. How do you then, as a teacher, help them become even more creative? Well, the first thing goes back to what we've talked many things. The first thing is give the students an opportunity to develop technical skill okay. that will allow them to do to the work. Well, it, think <laughs> about funny. it. No matter how creative you are with language, if you haven't learned a language that to speak, you may do marvelous scat singing as a child, but you're right. never going to turn it into words. I'm a scat man. Yeah. So that's why the photography student will need to learn exposure. They will need to learn the sensitivity of the receptor. They'll need to learn lenses. They're going to need to learn apertures and shutter speeds. And they're going to learn to learn light. It, I mean, photography means writing with light. So all of these technical things yeah. uh, are, are essential. And then once the technical things are established, there can, uh, coinciding with that, can be learning about creativity. But that once you've got the technical uh, uh, skills, then what's worth putting in front of a camera? And I can just put something in front of the camera, but it's all obvious. It's all stated. Wouldn't it be interesting to cut something out? Wouldn't it be interesting to do the opposite of what everybody else does in lighting a portrait? Put the person's uh, face into shadow. And that energy of what if, what if, what if, exploring around with things that haven't been done with because I want to get a mood out of this, or this person that I'm, I'm shooting is ill at ease. Let me tell you about a creative photographer, okay. uh, Steve Anderson. He, got, he took a photograph of me back in 2005, and he sat me down on a stool, and I was asking him, okay, what do, what do we do? And he didn't answer, and he was taking picture after picture after picture, and I said, do, I, do we have a conversation? Do I, what am I, I mean, how do you go about this? And he didn't answer. <laughs> and he kept this up, I don't know, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So you I, thought he was ignoring you? I, and I was uncomfortable. And afterwards he told me that he said he, he, that, that, was, that was deliberate. He wanted to see, he likes to make it so that you're going, you're in an emotional state and he's gonna find some things to work with. Uh, but you, now look what he's doing here. This he's putting you in an uncomfortable state. Does that mean that it represents you? Uh, he or, wanted genuine emotion and not smiling for the camera. Okay, smile for the camera, right? And you get something that's un unoriginal. It's it's in, it's inauthentic. Okay. And anyway, now here's the point. That was a strategy. That was a creative approach to how to handle somebody to get something out of them emotionally in front of the camera. Another person, you may do the opposite. They're uncomfortable, and so you have a conversation with them, and you get them at the unguarded moment where they are the most comfortable that they can be. But look what you're doing. Every person is different, mm -hmm. and so there's going to be a different strategy with every subject, and that is creativity. It's not going to go by the manual, sit down, count to three, say cheese, hold the... <laughs> It's, 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 it's uh, treating it so that each one is a new problem to solve. Right. Brad Holland was a creative illustrator. Great metaphors, juxtapositions, insights. He pointed out that the creation of Adam that Michelangelo did has nothing to do with the Genesis verse about God creating humans and breathing the breath of life into him. Instead, he's touching his finger. Uh, it's because Michelangelo understood that we've got something going on here. What's a different approach to it? And Brad Holland does that all the time. You've got the metaphor of the glass ceiling in business, that you can only rise so high before the glass ceiling lets you not rise any higher. And he did an illustration of a person standing on a stairway that the lower steps were small enough to where you could take a step and then you get to the point where a step is so high that it's above your head. It has nothing to do with a glass ceiling, but he could see the relationship between mm. glass ceiling and a stairway. So he came up with a new idea. Now, here's the reason I'm telling this story. Step by Step Graphics was a magazine that used to spotlight great illustrators and creative people. And they asked if they could do 
an article about how he goes about his ideas. And he said it would take the whole magazine and it would just confuse people. Because his process is so chaotic and so chasing rabbit trails around what it can be that he never knows how he's going to solve the problem. He just immerses himself in it and plays around. Vance Kovacs is, to me personally, one of the most creative, if not the most creative people that I know. And when I've asked him about his process, his process is different almost every time. Sometimes he'll go shopping. Sometimes he'll experiment with a new medium that he's never worked with. Usually he starts with research. Are those, is the variety random? Or no. does he make a decision because he thinks, oh, this yeah. new thing is going to help me figure out this problem? He chases impulses that occur okay. to him at the moment. So trusting just, your gut. Trusting your gut is a huge one at that point. But again, we're going into uncharted territory. Yeah. That's the thing. We're trusting your gut, but it may take me on a trail that, uh, mm -hmm. that never yields. Now, the best example of this in a book that I know of is Bob Mankoff, former editor of New Yorker cartoons, who wrote a book that several of us bought for one cent on Amazon which was great for us. It's called The Naked Cartoonist. That book is entertaining. It's almost surreal in how cartoonists come up with ideas. He claims cartoonists are the most, it's the most creative job in the world, and he makes his defense for it. But he talks through how you come up with an idea for a cartoon, and there's at least one portion in there where he has your head spinning with the craziness and the surreality and the chasing ideas that don't yield anywhere, and then eventually they do or don't. But that book is a great example of what one must embrace if you're going to chase creativity as a skill. How much do you think consumption has to do, to do with improving creativity? Because in order to combine many things together, you have to know and you have to experience many things, right? You have to see the world, you have to learn new things, you have to watch you, you have to experience. And so, how, like, do you think there's a, a specific balance between consumption and then creation? Should we minimize consumption or should we maximize it to be creative? It's kind uh, of a difficult It's a balance of, of consumption and production. And you've mentioned this. Too many <laughs> video games, yeah. And you're not actually producing any video games. Yeah. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi said that consuming culture is never as satisfying or rewarding as producing it. Yeah, I agree. And you know, I think it was John Gardner in his book, The Art of Fiction, talked about that even by the time you're four years old, you have all the raw material you need to be a novelist as far <laughs> as the experiences of life. You've experienced abandonment, you've experienced hatred, you've experienced terror, you've experienced all these things. So you got raw material there. Okay. to tell stories. Now it's a matter of getting it out. So, uh, And when you look at how creative children are by putting things together with their very limited... Yeah, but they're not solving real problems. They're just, they're kind of just oh, they doing are. things random. I mean, I guess so. Yeah. But so yeah, children have a, enough to do things, but not enough to like make a movie or no. Or solve, you know, um, cure a disease, you know. All right. Let's take, should I give an example from yeah. the childhood of someone I know and love? Your uh, son? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When he was two years old, at, for some reason, he had never seen a flashlight. For he some had, reason. He had seen a garden hose, but I had this flashlight. I thought, I, I want him to see this. And so I'd shine it. And he'd look around at it, and it was amazing. There's something in his hand, and you don't see the beam, and you see the result over it. And he said, squirt it over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He had seen a hose. He had never seen a flashlight, and he put the two together. So what was his intent was to communicate to me to do something, and he did this two-year-old connection that was, right. it was creative to solve a problem of, of communication. Yeah, I get it. So he figured out how to tell you to flash the light over there. He had a problem, he solved it, made yeah. a uh, connection nobody else would make, and it's worth But you're not trying to say that a, a two-year-old or a four-year-old has, has consumed enough to now be able to just create throughout their adult life. I am not. You still not. have to be consuming all the time. 
Now let's let's back up because I know we're chasing <laughs> rabbit trail. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess what I, my actual question is: How do you figure out that balance in your life? Because I know you consume. Hmm? You watch a lot of old movies old and you movies. watch them like a hundred times yeah. each. Yeah. Does that consumption make you more creative by watching the same movie know, so many times? Not necessarily. Why do you do it? I do it because I teach story students and I'm digging around in the treasure you chest. You teach story students or you teach students story? I teach students of story. Oh, story I, students. I, I teach <laughs> students about stories and particularly visual stories. And digging around in these old movies is digging around in treasure chests and pulling up coins that nobody knew So you watch them so many there. times because you're teaching that people this stuff. That's right. Okay. I've got enough to keep it's us busy for It's not for your for own years. creativity. Oh, but it, no, but it's for my own enjoyment. Okay. There's so many good ones. Uh, you can't teach creativity to people who are not interested in it. People who want to solve problems can learn a few things. And where we are in the conversation, I don't know whether we should you, wrap up to Do you have any other advice for people who are already creative but want to improve their creativity? Yes. You do? Yes. They are, they are some books. They are the one that I've already mentioned, Gabriel Rico's Writing the Natural Way is the most practical I know. Alongside that, I would put Sterling Hundley's ideation course. Those are the two best practical resources I know. Mm -hmm. And hire me as a teacher. I teach creativity to students who are interested in it. And I really believe in metaphoric thinking as a foundation to, to practice metaphor, to look at something and name it as something else the way children do, to, and to actually make that a skill that you'll spend a year working on. The four juxtapositions has to do with contrasts, balances, ironies. I think it's the second secret of, of creativity uh, uh, after metaphor is the use of opposites. I mean, when you look at the history of creativity, it is to think in terms of how you can make contrasting pairs and use yeah. them to balance each other out. And, and fun in the process, the enjoyment and the embracing of the process. Exploration. Exploration is just, the, the, that's a huge, huge part of it. Okay. attitude toward the project okay um i interviewed steve houston mm -hmm. and i asked him i think i don't remember my exact question but I, I asked him about the topic of creativity and he told me there's three ways to be creative tell us do you want to play it let's just play that clip so you have three ways to be creative you can be a craftsman you can follow the process of your teacher because it's a lovely process and it's okay. darn fun to do and you get good results. You get a B plus most every right. time. Nothing wrong That's with that. Right. Keeping the old truth alive. Mm -hmm. You can be completely original and make a jello skyscraper. Okay. But the problem with making the jello skyscraper or being totally original, usually, let's say 96.8% of that's garbage. Mm. It's poo poo caca, <laughs> <laughs> as we say in the business. We'll the you. problem is with craft is 98.6% of that isn't very good either. It was done way better before. Okay. And sometimes it's just darn horrible. You know, it's, it's all out of whack and stuff. Uh, so most of the time, you're not gonna be able to take it to these transcendent heights. And you'll, be, you'll have to work quite a while even to get to a mediocre height. Okay. You know, it takes you 10 years to learn how to be an okay drawer, oftentimes. Yeah, so, so the third one is... And I still can't, you know, I'm not an okay dresser. Uh, and, but the good. third way is the oil and water. Right. You take two things that are usually common knowledge and put them together. Okay. Beautiful design and computers that are easy to use. You take two, and it could be five things together. You know, comic books, boxing, abstract expressionism, religious light. Okay. And that way you're making the old thing new and you're uh, contemporizing it. The second and third one seemed very similar. It's come to taking things and putting them together. Mm -hmm. Jealous skyscraper. And then take the uh, third one was combining multiple old, things. Old and new. Old also. and new. They're very similar. I think the big difference there is like the second one was just trying to be completely original to the point where it's like, what's the point? Mm -hmm just to be original then the third one was combining things to actually do something useful yes and he mentioned there uh, making old things new again mm -hmm. i think that's a big one that you know you can you can improve on old ideas mm -hmm. 
Um, you don't have to be completely original. You can, you can just add a little element from something else and it is totally new and much more useful because you've added this one extra ingredient. And having that foresight or um, being able to know which ingredient to add, that's where the true creativity is. That's what is the most difficult part about this. It's not just finding random things and putting them together. And that's what everyone's focused on. But it's like, how do you, then, how do you get good at figuring out what ingredients to combine? I'm seeing another uh, balance going on here. It's goal-orientedness that I'm trying yeah. to solve a problem and dropping the goal-orientedness yeah. to mess around. And if all we do is mess around, we don't solve any problems. And if all we do is go for solving the goal, we're going to go to the manual and figure out how somebody right. else tells us to do it. Yeah. It's getting those two together. Yeah. I think getting lucky sometimes is, is a huge part of figuring out the ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe persistence mm -hmm. is huge there, to trying out a crap load of new things. Mm -hmm. But, with, you know, by following your gut, because sometimes your gut can, your subconscious could lead you to the solution because of your other experiences. Oh. That's where cross-training could come in. Mm -hmm. You might not know the reason, but your subconscious has learned patterns that lead you to these solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so, luck and experience. Rational <laughs> thinking and intuitive thinking is another part of it. The persistence thing, you know, everybody, uh, almost everybody knows uh, what a jerk Edison was now because that's just, because he was. But he has, through the 20th century, he was iconically the example of persistence. Mm -hmm. The story of how many things he had to use to find the filament that would actually turn right. into a light bulb. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm done. I want to throw one other thing in. Yes. It is the embracing of limitations. That is to say, how do you get out of this shirt? And a person gets out of this shirt doesn't mean much. How do you get out of this straight jacket now it means something. And so when there are a limitations put onto something, to create your own limitations is another useful creative technique. Say, I want to be creative. What's the normal way to do it? How could I make it harder for myself? How can I make this obstacle course almost impossible? And then the energy to solve it will come up. And we get stories like this all the time. Uh, Robert Rodriguez in that wonderful book, a diary book of his, uh, uh, Rebel Without a Crew, talked about how he invented, or he, he almost was credited by students with the inventing of a new cutting style. But it was really that he just got everything out of sync with the sound and had to constantly cut away from people's lip speaking to bring it back into sync. And students saw that and thought, what a great cutting style. So he had to overcome limitations, and in doing so, but he didn't intentionally create that limitation no, he for himself. But that limitation, yes, prompted his creative energy. I get that. I get that sometimes you have limitations thrown on you, and but basically that's problem solving. Yeah. But are you saying that sometimes you need to give yourself problems Maybe. in order to? When I mean, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just curious. Do you have any examples where someone created their own limitation in order to come up with something great? Well, yeah, Tom Sawyer is the one, first one that comes to mind. Tom Sawyer would want to make it the hardest thing possible so that he'd have something he can play with and we can invent. But that's just for their own enjoyment. For his own amusement, yeah. Yeah, just to uh, practice problem solving. But no, I'm right now I'm not prepared. I mean, yeah. I, I could think it through and, and find some examples <laughs> of it. Uh, I... I I mean, I've experienced it enough myself. A student of mine just told me recently that uh, a cartoon he likes, Thunderfist. Uh, so I guess he's a one-armed character or something, but that it came out, of, the solutions came out of the need for limited polygons in 3D models. And it's like, well, we've got this problem. Why don't we solve it this way? Yeah. Uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, they didn't have the budget for horse they ran out of horses uh, budget for horses so they figured well if you do coconuts together it sounds like horses clopping but, uh, but what are we going to show well why don't we show the guys clopping it together and then have somebody comment on yeah. it in the story so they couldn't bring a coconut back anyway wait a minute supposing two swallows carried it together
So again, it's the, it's not, that's not inventing it, but if you're making creativity a game, <laughs> why weird. not? Why not put a limitation on yourself, make it harder for you? It makes yeah. it so that if you're embracing that kind of limitation, you're embracing the energy that says, oh, good, this is going to be more of a challenge. Yeah. If you're going into a real profession where there's audience demand and there's money involved, you will have limitations on you, if no others, of time and then other things too, of budget you will just have problems that you're going to have to solve. So why not in your training as an art student say, I want to get ready to be creative. And this mm -hmm. is one way. Make it tougher. Yeah. Nice. Okay. That was fun. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Uh, I believe it's voicemail. Voicemail time. Oh, I yeah. like voicemail. Have you not learned this by now? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm starting to get it, but I'm a slow learner. Last time, you just, all you wanted to do was voicemail. Let's go, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to ask you guys a question, because in one episode, you mentioned a student who uh, did not even watch movies because he felt like he should be drawing. And you guys also, just in general, were saying that students who are the most obsessed are the ones who are going to succeed because basically they would rather die than not become an artist. Uh, I guess my general question is, how do you become superly, overly obsessed like that? Because uh, when I am drawing for uh, length, long lengths of time, I get this like sense of uh, that I'm feeling missed out on an adventure because I also like value adventure even though I don't really want to. I'll just be drawing and I feel like I'm missing out because there's people out there in the world that are like skydiving and water skiing and having all this fun and here I am sitting at a computer. Um, so how do you like, how do you... Uh, destroy that sort of feeling. I don't know how to really describe it in a single word, but um, how do you destroy that? And how would you get more obsessed? Do you guys have any tips for that? Thank you. I wouldn't try to destroy that feeling. If you want to go skydiving, go skydiving. Right? Yeah. I don't... And I hope... I don't... I hope I didn't give the impression that you need to be obsessed compulsively if you're going to succeed. It's just no. I've watched enough students who are and they are going to run ahead and you can yeah. hurt yourself you're going to hurt yourself you're going to hurt yourself and they just run ahead i don't think you can decide to be that yeah you you i think you it, are you've got the fire in you or you, you have the fire or or it grows like just cuz you don't have it now doesn't mean you won't mm -hmm. it might happen out of certain life experiences yeah I, I don't know maybe exploring some of these things will lead you to different things in your life like if you go on these adventures and explore the world you might find that you're really passionate about something else. Maybe it's not art. Why, like, why are you assuming that art is the thing that you have to be super passionate about? Yes, right? it's, like if it's you don't going with that. your gut for what you want to put your time into. Yeah. If all you want to do is go explore the world while you're drawing, drawing, then go explore the world. That's what you're passionate about. But then maybe if you go and then you realize it's, it's not something you want to do, then maybe your drive for drawing will become stronger. I don't know. Yeah. In, in Robert, Robert Sapolsky's series of lectures called Being Human, which are a wonderful series of lectures, he has one in there where he talks about as a research scientist in La Jolla, being in a laboratory where he could see someone who was, I think, hang gliding and the hang glider could see him in the laboratory wondering why would anybody want to be in a laboratory and he's in the laboratory seeing the hang glider thinking why would anybody want to hang glide over these rocky cliffs Interesting. and that reveals that some people really love being in the lab and doing this and other people would rather hang glide so yeah. this is where the going with your gut relates to what you're going to put your time into. If you really are, are feeling like I should be out traveling. Yeah, travel. Yeah. It might be the thing that brings a unique aspect to you as what you have to offer if you go back into the studio. But figure, one person is going to ex be an expert in fashion design. One person is going to be an expert in in horses. One's going to be an expert in uh, travel. And if you can find a way that you love different cultures, you love their, their architecture, you start to research that, you start to go and travel and take pictures and you're developing a library of all of this reference. And you may at some point without knowing it in advance, find that you love to do environment design and your travels contributed to it. Okay. I'm happy. 
I'm happy enough. <laughs> Should we go to that what is thing that? that we end on? Yeah. That's your thing, Stan. My thing this week is Stephen Bauman's drawing that I, I purchased. Mm -hmm. I don't collect too much art, but I'm starting to. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's my biggest one. That's my biggest purchase. Okay. Are we going to see original mm -hmm. art? Is this a setup, Marshall? Yeah. I'm new to this radio thing. Yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> You're learning. All right. I'll start with the little one. Tell us about this. I think I showed this one actually in a, in a video where I introduced my skulls. Uh-huh. Um, but this is a demo that Steven did um, for his students where he had a model and a skull in the same angle and he, he drew them both together and I just thought it was such a freaking awesome drawing I had to buy it. Don't you think this is amazing? Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> Good drawing. I love this. I love it too. Um, yeah, and you own it. I own it. Wow. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> And he did the little diagrams to show how he's understanding the light on the simplest curve form mm -hmm. and then putting it on the complex forms? Yeah. Did I, you see him do this demo? No, this is another demo for students. That, I, I haven't taken his classes. But. Maybe describe it a little bit for the listening audience? Well, there will be a link in the description for the listening audience. They'll just be able to click and take a look at the picture of it. Um, but yeah, it's a figure drawing. It's a study. It's a it's a really. I just love the rendering on this. The shading yeah. is just absolutely beautiful. Um, this is an this is an argument for learning rendering. Yeah, this is like technical ability. It's like if you, if you want to yeah. be able to draw life, you cannot who get can do it. that by just copying a photograph. No, you that can't. That takes the knowledge oh, of light not. on form. Yeah, this looks probably this looks very different from what was in front of him. Yeah. He has em embellished, is that the right word? Uh, it, well, interpreted might be a better word. He's made, made choices of what to subordinate, what to accentuate. But yeah. he did it by, he made these choices deliberately to get an effect he wanted and hopefully, I think, to improve it in his opinion of what improving it is. Yeah. Anyway. Right. Nice. I love it. Your collection grows. Yes, this is my part of my collection. Okay. Yep. And we shouldn't ask you how much you paid. Nope. <laughs> well, I thought I'd give it a try. I can tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll know. And I ain't giving it out to the public <laughs> for free. What's your thing, Marshall? Let me tell you. I had, I had heard of a filmmaker from the 1940s named Val Luton. He was a producer, not a director, for years. But I'd never seen any of his movies, but I've spent the last couple years in the 1940s primarily. Most of my movies have been there. And I heard that there was a documentary, 85 minutes long, that Martin Scorsese narrates on Val Luton's career. It was from about 1941 to about 1949. They are all black and white films. They were on really low budget. They were what they called B films, not the main film at the theater, the one that happens before the main film where everybody comes in and they talk and they eat popcorn and don't pay attention to it. They, uh, the studio forced the titles on these things. But when I saw this documentary, which I saw before I saw any of his films, uh, I could not believe how beautiful these images were Every one of these films, there's nine in the canon of his black and white films. He died very young, it's almost like the film industry did him in. But what he left with these, he had the limitation of very little money, no movie stars, forced titles, horrible titles like Cat People, Curse of the Cat People, in which there's no curse and there's no cat people. <laughs> Uh, I Walked With a Zombie, I, I Walked With a Zombie of those nine are my favorite. They aren't, <laughs> it's just a great, great film. Um, anyway, if you care about imagery and creating mood with imagery and with light, I recommend either his nine films, or if you don't mind spoilers, watching the documentary, Val Luton, The Man in the Shadows. And it will introduce you to what I think the, the 40s was, was, there are a number of film historians who believe that the 40s was the greatest era of Hollywood film. And I don't disagree with them. But I think of all of these 1940s films, if there was any one canon that I would go for, it would be these, which people call them horror films. They're not really horror films. They're terror films. And uh, 
And he, with those limitations, he had such a tremendous influence on later filmmakers because he had such limitations. But he did have one advantage. He had the leftover sets of big budget films. So he could do a little bit of what Rod Serling could do when he would walk around MGM Studios and get these sets and come up with ideas for Twilight Zones. What, what could happen in, in small town America? What could happen on this big staircase? Anyway, if you are a film buff or if you want to be introduced efficiently to 1940 cinematography, which is some of the great cinematography, Val Luton, Man in the Shadows, that's my thing. I've watched it about eight times, uh, a couple times by myself, other times with students. Very inspiring. How was that? That's great. Okay. It reminds me of silent films, the limitations they had, and yeah, how yeah, yeah. the like you know like people like Jerry Lewis and who's the one that you always talk about? Give me a hint. He he did like these crazy stunts. Buster Keaton. Oh, Buster, oh yeah, Buster, Buster Keaton. Yeah. Um, just yeah. like that doesn't exist now, right? Because it doesn't need to. Because of the, the, we have sound. Yeah, but some filmmakers revere the old movies enough to learn those lessons from them. Yeah. You know who Lon Chaney Jr. was? Or Lon Chaney, not Lon Chaney Jr., the old Lon Chaney. He was a silent film actor. He was one of the great uh, actors of, of uh, masters of costume. And in that, moguls and movie stars, they pointed out that Lon Chaney had two deaf parents. And okay. so as a child, he learned to communicate to them through body language. And then he became one of the premier silent movie actors. Awesome. Isn't that great? That is, There's someone who took the luck. limitations. That, well, yeah, it's the kind <laughs> of luck that most people would not be happy to be given. Yes. And then turned it into this thing that he no made. No luck, a, not that he was given <laughs> deaf parents, but luck that... He was, this happened to him at the time in the universe yes. when this would have <laughs> yeah, been yeah. the perfect time to be a silent film yeah, movie cosmic star. Luck. <laughs> it's like, I mean, what, what are the chances, right? Yeah, yeah you, 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 you would know his image from uh, Phantom of the Opera. But unfortunately, if you watch the silent version of Phantom of the Opera, I think it's 1920s, 1920s. Uh, that part where they remove his mask, unfortunately, everybody knows that scene. And that scene happens way into the story. And if you did not know that was coming, that would have been one of the most powerful emotional moments in all of cinema because you had so much foreplay before that reveal. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening yes. to the Draftsman Show. Five-star review. Am I getting pretty good oh, with this? Wow. You, just, you just yeah, you didn't did ask it. for permission or anything. You just said five star review. Yeah. Again, improvement. I knew you were gonna press me on it. So I here didn't we even are. have to ask. Yeah. This time. I'm getting it's like better. Double improvement. We're learning. Yeah. Okay. Next time it would be it'll be with enthusiasm. What should people leave in the comments, Dan? Uh Charlie looks like he has an idea. Come up with something like our uh, um, scuba diving. Bed come bed. up with come, come up, up with, with a jello two... skyscraper idea yeah come up with a jello skyscraper uh, oh, uh, uh, cloth hammer cloth hammer yeah yeah <laughs> old age wow never <laughs> thought of it yeah. you're good who would ever combine old and age yeah. together you're starting to get the knack of creativity creative. yeah <laughs>